prefer the uh, oh, they prefer the uh, in person classes. <laughs> sure. Hey, so I am just going to take over for a minute because I am um, sorry to interrupt the conversation because I don't know what happened to our presenter. I hope everything is going okay, but I have done the chaps. <laughs> so I thought I'd just look at covering um, a little bit of what's in it and what you get. And then hopefully Corey will be joining us. I hope nothing's happened. Um, but basically it's a three day course. Um, and the goals are really to help you understand um, the uh, home modifications business really well. I'm just checking the one last phone number I have, but I'm pretty sure this was the same one I just called. Um, but it's really to help you understand that, um, yes, the home uh, modifications business in the um, workers' comp area. And um, Corey um, Staver, who runs it, is an occupational therapist. They have been really setting a lot of the market for home modifications and doing a lot of stuff with that in that workers' comp. And so basically, you go through um, a lot of training and sections that are going to help you understand workers' comp because it's very different to the other stuff we're dealing with. There's a whole lot of different players involved. And so the first kind of module that you do with him is really understanding who are the players, what is the relationship, and what is the workers' comp um, concept of medical necessity and cost containment, and what does that look like when you're an occupational therapist playing in that field? What is really good about the training is that you have um, all kinds of people participating in this training. So you have the nurse case managers, you have some of the other providers, which is what you are in this area. Um, you also have um, some of the um, insurance intermediaries in the area as well. And so that's really, um, key in terms of providing you that. One of the key things you learn is that your client isn't the injured worker, it's actually the insurance carrier in that it makes it different in that respect from ADA, universal design, CAPS, all of those kinds of things in remodeling because you're working with your client is actually the insurance company and the insurance carrier. So trying to figure that out and learning to understand that from our perspective as therapists and what that means. That doesn't mean you don't consider the client. It is about the client, but they're not about your, the injured worker, but it's not, they're not your client. Um, and so learning to understand that and what the implications are for you as an occupational therapist working in that. TRAMP itself stands for Certified Home Assessment and Modification Professional. Um, and it is really the only course available designed specifically for working in that home modification area in workers' comp. And it really, um, it really outlines it for you. For me, it made a big difference um, in terms of understanding what was going on and giving you connections and ideas with that. So one of the things particularly that um, was an insight for me was learning how many people are involved and what all the different players are in there um, that I had never heard of before. Um, and so for me, that was key to know who is what and who can approve it and who doesn't approve it. But as we were having this conversation in the class and learning about that, you know, you had people sitting in the class that were third party administrators. And so they were coming to hear this perspective but they weren't gonna change their roles. And so you could have this discussion with them. So you were already starting this whole um, understanding different people roles and being able to, to hear how the other person was thinking and what that would mean when you're putting together a package for a client, for, an injured worker and doing the evaluation and what their role is. 
One of the key things, again, there were a couple of uh, nurses there that were from different levels. One was from actually the insurance carrier, and one was nurse case managers. So being able to understand those um, different roles and how they work together was going to also be important. Hang on, I'm just... Um, okay. So then the other piece that was really interesting was that identifying the role for the occupational therapist in there. And one of the things that this company has, has identified is that the OT role is specialist in functional rehab, specialist in activities of daily living, specialist in upper extremity rehab, specialist in uh, compensated, compensatory strategies, um, frequently takes treatment completed by the physical therapist and applies them in functional daily living conditions, home health and home assessments, ergonomics work, hardening, and caregiver training. So that's kind of the role they had outlined for OT. And then they looked at outlining the physical therapist role, specialist in physical rehabilitation, general and specific body strength, range of motion, conditioning, balance, um, home health, some of those factors, ergonomics and work hardening and caregiver training as well but looking at identifying those other roles, and sorry guys, I wasn't going to be planning on this. One of the things that we had talked about before was also being really clear in looking at terms that were going to carry the same meaning. We're kind of used to um, describing things in terms of the FIMS, right? in giving us a different kind of language outside of that medical um, abilities or medical um, framework that we're used to working in. Erin has um, written a question here is how widely known is in the workers comp world is CHAMPS designation? I'd have to say it's getting pretty widely known particularly on the East Coast um, because that is an area that the um, Corey Davis company is really working at several different programs there. They have large contracts um, with both building and um, remodifications and assessments, and they have big networks related to that, um, all within large um, TPA, which is the third party um, providers as well as um, with some of the primary um, workers comp insurers. It's interesting when you go to do the training, you, um, they have been doing the training in one of their elite offices in, um, in Florida, which was really tough to go to in February, I must admit. Um, thank you, Sheila. Yes, TPA, third party administrators for insurance. So, You've got the insurance company and then you've got someone down here, which is the TPA that is kind of playing the game in between um, of taking care of managing the claim. Um, and they did, his father's company started off with a lot of um, re, um, restoration after fire injuries and things like that. And then he came in as an occupational therapist and built this other company beside it to look at home modifications and home assessments and working in the workers' comp area on that. And so in terms of this company, they have built out a range of products and things that um, allow to work with the injured worker in a range of things. And they actually contract with builders and suppliers and therapists all across, particularly the east side, of uh, the continent, but uh, lots of ways to actually kind of not inflate the prices, but provide a good quality service with a consistent price to workers' compensation carriers. And they do everything from the skilled home assessments based on medical and functional necessity, which is why they train the occupational therapists to follow their protocol. And then con um, procuring the contractors standing up standardizing the construction prices, and then completing project management as well. And this specialty is looking at um, really complex claims, and that's what they're 
uh, goal is to work on those catastrophic files. And so on the um, East Coast, as I said, they're pretty um, well known um, for, for that. And then, um, so the David Corey company is the main company. And then from that, they have Free Life Homes and Champ Connect. And Champ Connect is basically where they try to connect the contractors, the DME providers, the specialists like therapists, and then with uh, some of like the case managers, the catastrophic claim managers, and the third party administrators. And so that's part of that whole network that they're building there. So when you go through that first part, kind of understanding all the terms in terms of workers' comp, those pieces is really um, the first part of the training. The second part is looking at some of the diagnoses that are common in these catastrophic claims that we're talking about for um, workers' comp, the most common ones tend to be spinal cord injuries, traumatic brain injuries, and amputations. And so you spend a lot of time talking about what are the expectations long-term, what are the home modifications that would need to be done for um, these clients? What would that look like um, in terms of the home modifications we would recommend? And so you spend a day going over those kinds of things, trying to look at understanding um, what would be medically necessary from the workers' compensation perspective in terms of home modifications. That was actually really interesting um, from my perspective. You know, I've been an occupational therapist for 40 years, and I've also worked, you know, inpatient rehab and rehab. Um, you know, long-term rehab in terms of those catastrophic injuries. But there was still a lot that I learned in terms of what were some of the modifications they recommended and what they would um, think about as options. One of the things that I also learned with this is um, to recommend a series of different options. Don't rule things out, but prevent, present the information with pros and cons and then let the carrier or whoever the decision making is for the insurance company make um, their decision about what option they're going to choose, but you've presented the pros and cons of abilities. And for example, I mean, things like alternatives between putting in a lift or adding on an addition to the house so that you're actually giving them, here's the possibilities, here's the, cost the pros and cons or potential costs and then here is um, you know how you might want to consider the long-term implications and they get to make the choices so that was really interesting for me learning those pieces under that section then they do a really good job of walking you through how to do an assessment and what's really interesting about the fact that it's in the um the company's big warehouse in Florida is that they have a house in there that is um, one that they use for uh, training people for restorations, but and they flood it multiple times a year, um, but it's then cleared up and dried because they have to do the restoration piece. Um, but they also then use it for us coming in, looking to assess for clients um, injured workers who have different injuries. And so you actually get as a group to do an assessment, to do an evaluation, and then um, come back and talk about it and look at all the options and choices and what you could or would have done or should have done differently with that. So that was Keith. And you go everything from the occupational therapy assessment to the construction estimate to potentially looking at um, what you were doing if you were going to be project managing it. Um, and then on the third day, so that was the second day, on the third day, we did things like common modifications and design. So thinking about ramps and routes, safety in and out of the house, walls, doors and floors, lifts, elevators, um, things in the bathroom, in the kitchen. So you spent a lot of time going through all of those um, different modifications and what they would look like, what would be recommendations, what would be things you would put in, 
how and why you would make the different recommendations. So it was um, really useful on that. But again, what was really interesting was actually doing that class with a, um, a nurse case manager, with a um, insurance carrier, with a DME provider, with a contractor who was um, doing some of this or people that had just been doing remodeling work. And then they're listening to your input, you're listening to their input and working on that piece. So that was really the helpful piece of that. The other thing that they do is they give you some ideas on marketing in um, workers' compensation, but um, it is to be part of their network as well um, so that you can actually do a claim with them. Was this training on the weekend? Um, no, it, I'm trying to remember. It was a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if I remember correctly. <laughs> and I don't know when their um, next training is coming because of COVID. Um, let me just pull it up. Um, I want to say consistently the training, I'm just pulling up the, the, the flyer, hang on one second. So there were 23, no, more than 23 of us at the training that was there. And they were all from different kinds of construction. There were four OTs um, there with part of it. Let me just. Let me pull up that piece. So the course was $800. You have to sit an exam afterwards. And um, it was in Jacksonville, Florida, which is where the house is. Oh, Sheila, thank you for looking up those dates. I know um, it, they also have it in a hotel there um, where they have everyone and it you do get a, um, discount on the hotel rate while you were there. Um, I shared with another girl, um, another OT from here. So that helped keep the cost down. Um, how is the CAPS Trust different from the aging in place training and CAPS? Birthday present for yourself, you land at Jacksonville, Florida on the coast for the birthday. Um, so what I found was really different from um, the CAPS training is that, first of all, workers' comp was a whole different bird. CAPS talks from more a building perspective and it talks from a non-medical perspective um, was what I found. In this situation, they were talking very much about um, what is medical necessity from the perspective of the uh, insurance company that's covering the claim? How can you best address the needs of the injured worker? The other thing that I found was different to the CAPS from that. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to understand the different layers of people involved in workers' compensation so that you know who you're talking to and you know who has authority to a, pay you or to approve the rec or the recommendations that you make and then um, how to go to someone if you're having concerns that the client or the injured worker, the injured worker in this case needs are not being met. The other piece that I really found is that it gave you a structured way to do an assessment and to look at the assessment, which I didn't see any of that in the um, CAPS course at all. And then the other piece that I thought was very different from the CAPS course um, was that it was a more detailed um, 
occupational therapy focused and functional focused review of the major disabilities that you don't see. So we were given um, big um, tots like this that I don't know if you how well you can see them, but it says here so activity for a C3 to C5 entries. At least two entries should accommodate a power chair. So immediately it's giving you the recommendations if you have a client with this diagnosis that you need to consider. Um, one entry should be enclosed, right? Consider automatic door openers. So for me, there was much more specific information engaged in that, um, in that there was a whole lot more specifics, I think, that were helpful just in terms of some of the client um, specific information. So these were all the ones on the spinal cord injuries that they gave you. So if they were independent, if they had care, if they had um, caregivers in place, what that would look like. So that was super, super helpful. And I've used it on other cases as well, because now I can go, okay, this person is basically functioning like a C3, C4 quad. So then here's some of the things that I need to consider and think about, and I have justification to help me do that. The other piece that I found was really helpful is just again, going over designing ramps and routes, looking at walls, and we spent a fair amount of time um, just not just with the specifics of ramps, because you know most of us are used to some of the specifics of designing ramps, but we did um, we did do the same thing with lifts, and we did the same thing with um, the kitchen modifications and what those would look like, and in the bathroom. So there was a whole lot of sections on options about what would you do here, what would you do there and those discussions. And I did not, while there were some very um, superficial or overview perspective in the CAPS course, I didn't provide, I didn't feel like it provided this level of information that was useful to me as a therapist. And so um, has that helped answer your question, Cass? Okay, good. Anyone else have any other questions? Corey was great as an occupational therapist looking at, you know, how he's built this company, how he's taken it from um, not even being considered to now a major player in the workers' compensation um, market. Is it only done in Jacksonville? Um, Yes, Chelsea, at this stage, because that is where they have the big home and they can get everyone together and you can go through that piece. That's where their company is headquartered. Um, I don't know what his plans are now. I know he was talking about at some stage trying to see what the other options are, but that was it at this stage. Yolanda. Hey, Sue. So... Okay, so we do the training with Corey. Now, do we contract with his company to get referrals or you register with um, like different workers comp? So you can do both. Okay. Yeah, so um, hang on one second. Hello, who did I just admit? Somebody just called in on the phone. Can you unmute him, Sue? Or if that's him, I don't even know, but can you unmute that person? It's a 904, so that's probably him. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm thinking that might be Corey. Corey, whoever that is on the 904 number, can you unmute yourself? I can't do it. I'm trying to remember what unmute is on Zoom. Does anyone remember if you're on the phone, what unmute is on Zoom? I don't know that one. I don't either. There you are. That, 
that will do it. Hey guys, it's Corey. <laughs> Hey, Corey, I kind of um, did a really poor job of going over what you taught us, but. Um... <laughs> I'm sorry, guys, for the delay. Um, what can I do? What can I do for you? What can I help you with? Um, so they were asking questions about the course and what um, what you would sure. what it would give people, what it would mean in terms of being able to connect with uh getting referrals, et cetera. Sure. So I'll give you a Reader's Digest version of it. And uh, so in brief, um, the program, the CHAMP certification was written originally for contractors. We had started our program and I was recruiting contractors, but they knew very little about how to work within the workers' compensation um, industry. And so um, what we found was, is that, you know, the home modifications in, in general and throughout, you know, whatever, I guess more, what I'm trying to say is that in general, the home modifications programs that are out there are more for aging in place, um, uh, fall prevention, and what, what we do in workers' comp is uniquely different. So there are a lot of things that if you're going to be wanting to use that as an addition to your current practice um, that you want to know um, who the players are, what the rules and regulations are, what is generally accepted and, and denied based on the various diagnoses and, and, and based on the states that you operate in. So there's a lot of things that can get you in trouble and a lot of things that can make you uh, very attractive to uh, an insurance company. And so what we found was is that when we were working with contractors who didn't understand the industry, that um, even though they were good at building a wall, they could, would frequently get in trouble or cause issues because of things they said, didn't say, things they encouraged and didn't encourage. So I thought it was important that if people wanted to work in this industry, that they understood it from a provider's perspective. So initially, it was for just contractors that we worked with. And then um, after a period of time, we realized we really needed to begin to educate um, accessibility specialists as well as some of the insurance professionals as well, case managers, uh, adjusters, et cetera. So from an accessibility specialist standpoint, um, it's important that, that you understand that there is um, a unique approach in this industry and it is one that is based on uh, medical necessity, um, based on what we call functional necessity. And it's really important to understand how that applies. So the whole um, direction we take with accessibility specialists is really helping you navigate and understand who the players are in the industry, um, who the, uh, and, and what the challenges are that you face. And, uh, and that is everything from the assessment, um, uh, understanding the roles and relationships, uh, all the variable, all the variables that you have to deal with, understanding your, you know, what goes on in your state, and um, just really how to na navigate that to you, to where you have the most success that you possibly can if you follow that and continually do it. The other part of it is networking, so getting to know um, some of the other people in the industry who are doing this. Um, I'll tell you, it's interesting on um, LinkedIn, we just did a survey, um, uh, just a four-question survey, and it was basically one of the most difficult things with home modifications and, and workers' comp. And the number one response was finding a qualified contractor. And number two was uh, um, coming to an agreed scope of work or the correct scope of work. Um, I used to think it would be money. It was all about the cost, but it's really not. And in my personal opinion, the, the development of the scope and the correct um, recommendations should fall on an accessibility specialist, not necessarily a contractor. So contractors, they don't trust. Um, developing the appropriate scope is usually developed with a relationship with a quality accessibility specialist. And in my personal opinion, OTs have the best uh, position to present that, but it's not just knowing how to do it with uh, with like ADA, universal design, all the typical things that we follow. It, it's really taking it to the next level and approaching it um, 
that's in the unique way that the workers' comp does. So our three-day course is really about that. Um, so if if you're already doing home mods and you're and you're participating in it and you're building your practice and you think, gosh, something like the workers' comp industry might be a good bolt-on to what I'm doing right now, this would be a course that would help you. Uh, it'd probably save you a lot of time, money, energy, frustration. I, I wish I, I had had it when I started 20 years ago. Um, but nothing existed at that time. So that's really in a nutshell um, of what it's really all about. And then we, and what, the one other thing I would say, Sue, is that we also, in the process of developing what we call our Champ Connect program, which should be rolling out right now. Um, COVID's kind of put the, the hamper on it a little bit, but starting um, first quarter this year, we hope to be rolling out our site that allows you to have um, where carriers can actually find you and where you can market yourself to our industry. Um, that should be rolling out first quarter. So we'll see how that rolls. So, but any, any thoughts, questions that I hit the, the points to? I'm glad you're here. We're here to make the point. <laughs> <laughs> Is there yeah. anything else that I can, I can answer for you or? Any questions? Yeah, so if people wanted to sign up, um, we were seeing that potentially there's a training course coming up in January or? Yeah, so we have um, we have a, a January, I want to say um, 26th, 27th, and 28th. It's in North Florida. I would say that, you know, we're trying to hold that down to less than 20. 20 or would be the max, just because I know there's some concern about traveling and um, you know, all the precautions with COVID and everything, but right now we have it scheduled. We have about 12 or 13 signed up right now. Um, contractors, um, a couple of adjusters, but I would suggest if you want to do it, if you're, if you're interested, um, it's, it's fully refundable if things happen or, or if this lockdowns happen or whatever we may, if, if, if it looks like there's going to be a big problem, We'll just um, move it a month or two in advance and, until we can get on site. But um, the best way to sign up right now would be probably to um, either call our office or email me, and you you guys can easily pass out. Um, so you can send out my email address if you want to, or uh, reach out to Judy at our office, Judy S at DavidCoreyCompany.com. And, I think Sheila um, and we can had send you the application. That email. Yeah. Yeah, that would that would be fine. Okay, great. And then um, we have a couple of more questions here. So, does the class sure. teach you how to market yourself? Um, because I know you talked about um, Champ, correct? Um, connect, yeah. Connect, yeah. yeah. But are there other ways that you would teach people to market themselves, or how they could get more work from having done this course? Yeah, sure. So. Um, the first part of the course is we're talking about who the players are. And during that time, we, we tell you who our competitors are, where, where are the bulk of the business coming from out there. And so I, I, a long time ago, it was really all about us. But right now, it's really all about helping you be successful in the things that you do. So we're happy to um, give you the information of some of the other companies that are looking for people like yourselves. And we do go into that. And um, the other part of it is as well as we will actually give you that contact information. Um, and then, then, then we'll, we'll point out some things you can do locally to attract the attention and maybe what, what are the most um, common ways that we think that you could build a practice. Great. Yeah, so, so a couple of things related to that. I know, Corey, for people who participated, you had started sending out a, an email newsletter with some ideas and hints uh -huh. in it, right? Mm -hmm. And yep. um, Aaron, were you going to ask a question? Sorry, I didn't realize my microphone was unmuted. I was typing um, a message about, do you also address marketing to plaintiff attorneys. I hear you talk about the insurance company, um, but sure. plaintiff attorneys seem to want different things. Yeah, they do, right? And that's the, that's kind of the, um, 
so it, it's a matter of, I, and I tell our claimants attorneys as well as defense attorneys, I don't care who hires us or who, who would hire me personally, you're going to get the same report. Um, there are challenges because, you know, when you're working for on the claimant side, they're right over your shoulder saying, well, don't you think it would be reasonable if, and don't you think it would be more of this and their, their whole, their whole project. I mean, their whole approach is to expand the scope as widely as possible to encourage a higher estimate, usually to settle the claim. Um, usually on the, the claimant side, the, the, the attorneys generally want to settle that. Or, uh, and so they're really looking to expand it as much as possible. And I've been on, I've been on claims where, um, I mean, I'll, I'll be on one day after tomorrow uh, doing a virtual deposition on that very thing where we've provided um, a recommendations and scope of work and the carriers authorized it. And now the attorneys come back and said, no, we want a lot more. And we have to now justify why we recommended what we recommended and did not include things that they think are reasonable. So it's a matter of you can do that. And I'll tell you that in 20 years, I've only two or three times worked for claimants attorneys. And I, it's not because I wouldn't do it. It's just once they see m my approach and um, our training and our, what we feel is reasonable, a lot of them won't just don't call. And I, I guess personally, I've gotten a reputation for working and being hired by a, a carrier, but that's, but I've been asked many times, um, actually I've been asked before to work on the same file on both sides, but I, I believe in personally that you do the right thing and you do it reasonably and you don't let influence happen one way or the other. So um, working for a claimant's attorney is not a bad thing as long as, in my opinion is as long as the claimant's attorney is looking for really truly what's necessary and reasonable and then I don't have a problem with it. I think it's it's a great way to do it. Okay, so, um, sorry, I have a, I have a couple of other questions that came up here. Sure. Um, does the training include education on uh, scope writing at all? Yes, sure. So it'll 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 help. Um, It'll help a lot with designing. Well, it'll help a lot with understanding scope and how to approach it, and then how to position it in the comp world to justify why you're doing it. And I think you, even when you were there, and we we go through the house that the house under under roof basically, and we we give you the the different diagnoses, and you create a scope based on that diagnosis, and then you present it to the class, and then I'll sit back and challenge your thoughts and reasons and how do you justify it? And it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a pretty cool educational process as far as understanding how to present your scope and how to develop that scope. But I'll tell you that there's nothing better than experience. You know, we're taught things in school and then we're taught things in courses. And then you take that information and you begin to apply it yourself, but having a good head start on, how to write your report, um, how to how to justify that in order to uh, present um, and get the outcome that the carrier is trying to achieve or whoever's trying to achieve it, who's, who's ever hired you. But certainly positioning it with justification is important. And so, yes, helping develop scope is important. Yeah, I think it helped me with understanding scope more and also being a little bit more um, specific when I did scope. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was, remember the, on my survey, 30, I think it was 34% said finding a qualified contractor and then 32% was arriving at the appropriate scope. So I'll tell you that the majority of the insurance companies and the people in the industry, either the claimant side or the carrier side, are all trying to get an appropriate scope. And there's just no real standards out there other than a few loosely put together um, thoughts. And I guess, um, I, I guess, I don't know what the term would be used, but it's really a frame of reference, I guess would be the best term to use in, in workers comp. And, uh, and actually we're trying, we're working with some companies right now to, uh, let, to encourage the CHAMP program and some of the things that we're developing become a standard, at least in workers comp for accessibility specialists and contractors, because there's really not. So the more you can understand 
um, the uniqueness of our industry and the specifics of developing scope, it's, it, it, it really helps out a lot. Uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, so I have a couple of more questions. Do you get CEUs for attending? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. And we we have worked with the CEU Institute and we have developed it. It's interesting. I'm trying to remember um, if the AOTA, oh, who recognizes it? But yeah, yeah, we've done it. Um, we usually do work with the um, CEU Institute to make sure it's and the other thing to let you know, too, is even if there's a situation in your state that doesn't, let's say it, it isn't registered in your state, is we've, um, we've had other therapists petition their, uh, their bodies and their states, and, who, and they've gotten, they've gotten uh, credit for it. I even got credit for it when I wrote it. So I think um, NBCOT as well, there's a way to submit some things that don't have a right, right. uh, piece, but you do get, you have to take an exam at the end of it. Yep. Do you absolutely. go home and you do get a certificate. So there's that, there's the outline and the stuff that you can put in that would um, help support your case for CEUs. And, and there's a 120 page book that goes with it as well. So I mean, you can... And it's something that um, it's interesting. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll look more into that. But we certainly have been uh, pushing CEUs. I know the we CEUs were given to the adjusters, um, the case managers, um, and so yeah. So the other question I have here is: How often are you look at looking at running the course if somebody wasn't able to look at January? Yeah, good question. So we normally do it uh, about three times a year. Um, last year we only did it once, um, and then COVID kind of hit, so we just canceled um, the one we did at the end of the year. So we're doing one in January. Uh, we'll probably do one again in May, I think, around May, um, maybe June, and then we have our annual conference. So, um, and by the way, our conference is is different. So the training is three days of that's just education but our conference our champ connect conference insurance companies come to that providers come to that ramp companies come to that um, dme companies come to that and and um and what you do contractors as well and so if you decide you know and it's it's really designed to take people who are champ certified bring them together and then let them really network and connect with other people in our industries and it's a conference that is based on TED Talks, kind of that mindset. So we have about 20 minutes of, of someone giving a, um, a, a presentation on a topic that's real challenging for our industry. And then we have table agitators that are um, and around each table. You have people that are some people that are accessibility specialists, contractors, adjusters, providers. We had attorneys. And so you're sitting around a table. And which is really unique because there's not very many times that you actually get to sit with an adjuster or a case manager from a, from a corporate office. And then the, the topic may be what's the most frustrating thing about, you know, the whole modification process. What we have another one that was focused on what about me, which is how to get more engagement with the injured worker and their family to improve the communication and the outcome process. And, but then you're able to really, share your concerns, your frustrations with each other, maybe about each other. And then the facilitator comes to the front um, for the last 30 minutes, agitator does from each table, and then there's a group panel. So it's very much interactive and it's a really cool way to network with people in the industry from all over the country. And it's, it's a pretty cool thing. So we're, we didn't have it this year. We'll have it again. I think we do it in July or August. Where so that's do just you another call opportunity. Those? Where do you hold those? Uh, we well, we've we uh, let's see. Year before we did it. Uh, last year we did it in uh, Houston. No, it was in Austin. Um, we've done it in Punta Vedra here in Florida, and this next we where we were going to do it was in Savannah, Georgia, on the river up there. So I think that's probably where we're going back to this because we already had all the all the stuff put together and contracts put together, and they allowed us to defer it. So. Beautiful location. 
It was usually around around 200, 200, 220 people, 230 people, depending on the situation. So. Okay, so I have another question here. How much is the course, and will any be anything be virtual if there's a strict lockdown? Yeah, so the course is eight hundred dollars for three days, three full days. Um, it is not virtual right now, and part of that is is because of the we like to use this. Um, uh, we part we we use the training facility that's by Paul Davis Restoration and Remodeling, and they have a house that's built inside of an industrial complex under roof so it's an it's a two-story home with a kitchen and bathroom and bedrooms and living room and a garage and we actually use that to measure draw and design and so the in-person that piece is a little hard to duplicate that being said we have begun the process of creating uh, we've been contracting with a company called Lightspeed out of Las Vegas to develop an online um, CHAMP certification program. And we're, we're playing with that. It probably won't be ready for uh, maybe a year because we're really trying to figure out the best way to make that happen. I still have the interaction um, without necessarily having the on-site thing. So there might be something, if we have to cancel January, I might, try to come up with a way even either through zoom or whatever um and see if there's a way we can do it it's it it's eight hours a day and then dinner and networking so it's i don't want anyone to sit in front of a thing for eight hours and if we don't do it in three days that means we have to stretch it out over multiple week period and my concern is is that um we when we first started the program that's how we did it and then you would get half the class there and half the class not there. And then they would want to remake and it just became difficult. So we're considering that right now it's not in place. Yeah. I mean, we were eight hours a day in class. We'd have a bus that would take us over to the, to the building yeah, right? to the facility, and uh, you guys would feed us really well. Good. I'm glad the food was good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think the interaction is just really good. I just think the debate is good. The challenges are good. And the interaction is so important, especially when you're, when we're talking about something that is very unique and that needs, it's a niche within the workers' comp industry. And um, so, but we're, we're open to looking at other options as well. Other, um, anything else? So I have a question from another person who said, are we functioning as an OT? And I think um, this is your chance to go back as your accessibility specialist. Yeah, it's a great question. So I'll even tell you for myself, we're hired as accessibility specialists with backgrounds in occupational therapists. That's my frame of reference. That's my that's where, why I do what I do, how I do it, but it's not under my um, or, or anyone's occupational therapy license unless you want it to be. We're not doing anything clinical. We're not, we're not touching the injured worker. Most of the time, the injured worker is not even at the house. So what, what we do is we take, and we, for me, and you may operate your business completely differently, but for me, we received the documents from the rehab facility. We review them. So we have a fairly good understanding of the functional abilities, the deficits, and the challenges they may have. Um, we visit the home. We complete our on-site assessment, which is more structural at that time. It's just receiving information and documenting some good, inf um, you know, the, the floor plan measurements, the photos, everything that we normally do. We go back, we create um, digital drawings, and then we create our report. And then we're hired uh, more as accessibility consultants and who have a rehab, rehab background. Now, if in your practice and in your territory where you're licensed, if you're going to be doing anything hands-on and with the patient themselves or the injured worker themselves, if you're going to be making clinical recommendations about um, equipment, maybe you are an ATP as well as an OT, or if you're actually going to be providing therapy 
then you would want to do that under your occupational therapy license. We've worked, um, we have trained and worked with um, certified occupational therapy assistants, so CODAs. We have OTs that we've worked with and trained. So um, it, it's not necessarily specific as an OTR, but just letting you know that in my personal opinion, the flexibility I have by not necessarily um, but working under my license or being a licensed occupational therapist who does this, uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility. But you have to be very careful that you're not um, breaching over into patient, direct patient treatment or direct patient care. And that, that's where you would have to draw the line. <clears throat> Okay, I think that the last of the questions I have right now, does anybody else have anything? And by the way, you can you can give my email address out and if I'll, I'll be I'll be actually in, in town until Friday. So if anyone wants to uh, send me an email or ask a question they didn't ask today or they think of something that I'm happy to answer, not a problem. I have a question. Uh, what is the typical volume of referrals that we should? Yeah, that's a, yeah, it's a good question. So um, I guess that there's there's a lot of variables there, right? So if you're in a, a high metropolitan area, um, there's a greater volume of claims. If you're in a more remote area, there's not as many. But I'll tell you that a lot of the accessibility specialists um, cover like a, a half a state or more and and they'll get a variety of assignments from different people so um it's, it's really hard to say but what i would suggest is i mean i i've been very fortunate um over the last 20 years that my entire practice um and my entire business is 100 percent workers comp i i will tell you that in 20 years we've we've handled maybe 10 or 15 assignments that were not workers' comp specific. <clears throat> we do between um, 250 and 350 assignments a year. Um, <clears throat> our highest we've done was approaching 400, and probably half of those are catastrophic claims in nature, meaning spinal cord, brain injury, amputees, um, chronic pain, burns. Uh, the average size project on our catastrophic side is about um, $85,000 to $125,000 in mods. The average size job that is non-catastrophic, which is more of our, what we call our contractor direct, where they really don't need a full-blown assessment, or maybe it's a temporary mods, or maybe it's something more simple, that ranges between 25000 about for anywhere from eighteen to $25,000. Um, so we certainly get assignments that are four or five hundred dollars, a few grab bars in the handheld shower unit. Um, but we also get assignments that are an entire home tear down and rebuild. Um, the largest one we've had in 2020 was um, about 480,000. The largest one we've worked on in the last 20 years was over a million. And that was in Southern California, and we had to build retaining walls and a whole bunch of other things. So there's a lot of complexities. We have um, the variety of diagnosis. Are we have uh, right now? We have we're working with two police officers that were shot during the riots recently. We have um, another cop that was run over. We have you know all the typical firemen, policemen all of those, but we also have people pulled at we this year, we had people pulled into wood chippers. We've had simple slips and falls, um, a lot of automobile accidents. If you're working and you're injured, that's where our world is. And so you, it, the stories are remarkable. The injuries are, are so catastrophic at times. Um, and the opportunity is really amazing to do some really neat things for people who um, it's not preventative as much as it is. We already know what the diagnosis is. And so now we have to make it work for them. And that's, it's really, it, it's really a very rewarding 
and positive thing that we're doing. Um, it's, it is frustrating at times because we have limitations and our heart says, I want to do more. And um, we, you know, as OTs, the majority of us have gone into the business because we want to help people. And our mind is whatever we can do to make life more meaningful and productive and independent, et cetera, et cetera, is what we were just being trained to do. That's what we're, that's what we do. And workers comp, it's not that we don't have that freedom and the weight that goes into our recommendations is, is very significant when it comes to the outcome of the project. So um, there's a lot of litigation in workers comp. So if you're a little nervous about being deposed and having maybe to give testimony, um, yeah, I would recommend not worrying about it, but it's going to happen sooner or later. And, and that's okay. You're just needing to justify what you're recommend, what you're recommending, but it's a really cool opportunity. I know I'm taking a long time to just simply answer. I don't know the answer to your volume, um, but that gives you an idea about what we've done. And we're, we, we do this on a national basis through our relationships that we've developed over the years. Um, we have anchor clients, um, which are some major insurance companies. Um, if I was in a local area, and I'll just, here's a, some free information, the best way to begin to develop your business is to identify who the case managers are in the workers' comp world in your, in your local area. And once you get to know them, they're a great, uh, a great resource um, of introduction to companies that are in your area. And we'll help you understand who those people are. But it is working with the um, – it's finding out who the players are in the various companies in your local area. And, okay. Um, That's great to know. I'm in Macon, Georgia, which is like 75 miles south of Atlanta, sure. and right there in the middle of Columbus and Savannah. And that's and actually a good area. It's a great area. Okay. So my – not. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you there's not a lot of – and so the nice thing, I'm sorry, let me just say this real quick. And I know you're about to ask something else. The nice thing about Atlanta is that's where Shepherd Hospital is, right? Yeah. And Shepherd is one of the, one of the top three um, centers of excellence for workers' compensation, spinal cord injury, especially in the country. And right. so people are sent there from all over the country and all over the world. The world yeah. And they, yeah. Then they go back to where they were. There's only that I'm aware of in the workers' comp world, there's only two occupational therapists that it's in the greater Atlanta area um, that cover, and they'll say they cover almost the whole state, that are, um, that are involved. And they're both good, um, but I think there's a good opportunity to develop a practice in the greater Georgia area. And that's what I would tell you, I, 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 for anyone else listening, I don't know where you're all located, and I will tell you right now, in my personal opinion, in our industry nationally, there's probably only, man, that I personally know, there's probably only six or seven OTs that are in the workers' comp world that have developed a business that carriers are they are go-to people, and that and the, re the reason they become go-to people is one because they're trusted to understand the business and the industry and that they are consistent and reasonable with what's being presented and there's not many i think there's a great opportunity for people who are really want to take their time and learn the industry and be committed to it and just you know in any insurance industry especially in workers comp it's my stepdad used to say working with carriers is like dancing in molasses you're moving but things are really slow and my very first anchor contract was with travelers insurance i got offered the contract and a year later was when i actually got the contract so i would suggest that you need to just stay the course recognize it's a marathon and not a sprint and that it takes a little time and then when it breaks it'll begin to break for you and it'll become a much more profitable and enjoyable um, process for you and you'll, it'll be it'll be successful if you give it time and you do the right thing right um, i'm excited thank I'm you I, Corey, I, I have a quick question for you 
This is Erin. Mm -hmm. I'm an OT in the Atlanta area, and I worked at the Shepherd mm -hmm. Center. Um, Do you Dave know uh, Jen Hudgens? Yes. Yeah. yeah, very well. I was in the um, assistive technology program. Wonderful, wonderful. So here's my question. Um, are, when you're deposed, do they mm -hmm. try and discredit you as being someone who only works for insurance companies? Is that yes. one of the ways that the attorneys go after you? Because I know um, when I was deposed working for an insurance company, uh, they were asking, you know, how many uh, cases I had been deposed on for which side. And yeah, then, exactly. <laughs> I did I did a good job for the insurance company so that the plaintiff's attorney hired me for another case um, to work on his yeah. side. But yeah. I was wondering, so, is that one of the ways they try and discredit you? Yeah, they do. They try and discredit you for that. Though. I had one. I spent 45 minutes being challenged, and they went back. Um, to my first degree, to my second degree, to the college I went to, to they tried to discredit. I mean, if they knew my mom's name, they would have discredited, tried to discredit my mom. I mean, it was that kind of ridiculous. And then after 45 minutes of trying to discredit me, they gave me five minutes of questions that were relevant to the case. So I, I and I, they do, but you are right. They will, if um, they, they, I've been asked how many times have you done it for plaintiff's attorneys? Are you considered a, are, are you actually considered an expert by the courts in any particular, any, any particular state? Um, and then my response has always been, uh, I've never turned down an assignment from a claimant's attorney, plaintiff's attorney. The difference is, is that I'm just not called that often. And I said, it's not by my own doing, but I would, and I, then I tell him again, I don't care who hires me. You're going to get the same exact report. And, um, and uh, the problem is, is that when I, when I, when a, um, claimant's attorney calls and I tell them that they recognize that I'm not going to be influenced, um, by their standing over my shoulder, telling me, this is what I want you to say or write. So because of that, a lot of times I'm not personally, I'm not, um, hired, but I will all, oftentimes I'll refer them to another OT who might. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you, they'll, if there's an opening, they're going to try and discredit you, but that's, that's a very good point because that is true. And those are great discussions that we have in class too. So whenever we, we get into it, we'll, we'll bring those up. Thank you. I recently yeah. had yeah. Um, scheduled uh, email for a, a patient. Well, she was a workman's comp, but she was a catastrophic. <laughs> And it's been such a hard, try, hard time trying to just get her to do her OT eval. So I think that would be something to, to kind of work into it because it was requested by her insurance, but she just didn't want to do it. She felt like she was just so overwhelmed. So when you mentioned that right. about the cat topic, I thought about her, you know, using a different approach if it was just for the uh, home mod portion of it instead of just the mm -hmm. OT side. So that's a great point. And what you're bringing up is interesting because what we basically become as an accessibility specialist and what I tell the carrier and what I tell everybody is that we become the eyes and ears for the insurance company or whoever, or whoever sends us out. And for the injured worker, I need to be the chief storyteller. I need to be able to go to the house uh, or to the residents, wherever that happens to be. I need to be able to, when I leave there, by the time I leave there or any of our accessibility specialists leave there, I want them to be able to go back to document and to tell the best story they can on behalf of the injured worker. What's the living conditions like? Not just about is it accessible or not. What's the dynamics in the family that you find out? You find out so many things that can be important to the outcomes of the claim that the because most insurance companies will never be outside, right? They have the case manager and then they have people like us who are outside quote unquote vendors who are coming in. Um, and we have to be able to tell the story clearly 
and definitively to the point that our recommendations make sense. And there are many times that our recommendations go beyond just the structure of the house. And I don't mean as in from a rehab perspective, but from a family dynamic, things that you find out, it might end up being, I was asked at a conference in North Carolina, if I had ever seen a home that could not be modified. And my response is then, and it is today, I have never seen a home that couldn't be modified. I've seen homes that shouldn't be modified, but I've never seen a home that couldn't be modified. And so sometimes our recommendations are, look, if you decide you want to modify this home, this is what you would have to do. Now, I don't think it's the best thing, but it can be done. And, but here's some other options to consider as well. So sometimes our story and our presentation and our representation goes beyond just the structural piece. But your point about uh, you have a person who's in the home and they're catastrophic, they don't want to, they don't want to mess with the rehab anymore. They don't want to continue with OT or have an OT eval. Um, while we're on site, because of our clinical training, there's a lot that you can observe. You know, you don't have to say, I get up and walk for me. Let me see how you transfer on and off the toilet. Let's figure out how you get in and out of the shower. But through just your clinical skills and observation, you have an ability to come back and tell the story. And not by doing it um, clinically so much, but as by saying, this is what I observed. He walked about 15 feet with assistive device. Um, but he also said during the day that he is, he gets tired and fatigued. And so he's only able to do that for a short period of time. And therefore he becomes more wheelchair dependent during the rest of the day. And so you're telling a story while you didn't purposely go there and do um, a functional assessment you are recognizing things that because of your clinical judgment that you can include in your report. And I think that's very, um, I think that's carriers and whoever hires you um, admires that and respects that. That's something that sets you apart from an ATP. It sets you apart from uh, a contractor who, uh, who's out there. But for every OT that's into this business and workers comp, there's 50 contractors who say we can do an assessment ourselves and letting a contractor and my, and I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone, I don't mean to be, but I believe that letting a contractor do an assessment is like letting a Fox guard the hen house. It, it there's, it's just contractors, um, excuse me, most insurance companies don't trust contractors and they think that they're going to expand the scope to make more money. So what you become is a very nice um, point of cushion that protects the insurance companies from of things that become overscoped and overexaggerated and overpriced, and um, you keep you help manage the 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 ability to limit scope creep, um, and they trust you for that. And when you can build trust with an insurance company, you go from being a vendor to a strategic partner. And that's where the sweet spot is in building a long-term relationship and long-term position with the carrier. It's about not telling them what they want to hear. It's telling them the facts, helping them to understand the realistic expectations and the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, and then helping them to make their decision. I will tell you that I'm a big believer that it's not our responsibility to tell the carriers what they have to do. It's our responsibility to point out the pinch points within the house or within the residence and then I'll offer them opportunities by giving them different options on how to achieve that outcome and then letting them make the decision on what they want to do and not want to do. I think we get in trouble when we try to control it and tell them this is what you have to do. And that's not what we're hired to do. So we'll, the, the method that we've developed over the years is really designed to help put you in a position that you're a respected consultant rather than consider just an OT or an accessibility specialist who goes out and puts something on paper. It's re you really want to position yourself as, as a um, reliable consultant more than anything else. I'm rambling. Anything else? Yolanda had a question on the um, board about how many CHAMP specialists are there in the country 
And I would add mm. to that because a lot of what you talked about in terms of what you do with your business, you do a lot of contracting work with that. So when you're talking about those big projects, how does the role for the accessibility specialist and um, the funding or the what kind of um, reimbursement project are you seeing? Okay, so um, there was a two. That was a two-part question. The second part was, um, I guess, the role or, or what's the scope of your role? Would that be a fair way to put it? The scope um, of our so role. So we talked is, about. Yeah, and the scope of our role, which I think you've given some in the last discussion, but okay. when you were quoting yeah. the figures about the projects before, they were large figures. As the accessibility right. consultant, they're not the kind of money we're going to see what would be kind of the reimbursement for an assessment right 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 so if that's a great good question so let me let me start by saying it depends on how you want to build your business so i my um my company um is a turnkey housing it's, it used to be home modifications it's really it's more about housing solutions than it is about just home modifications um, all all home mods are broken up into three basic um, phases. Phase one is the assessment, which is starts with the assignment and ends with an agreed scope of work. Phase two is estimating, which is helping um, is helping the GC arrive at an appropriate cost for the insurance carrier and and at a price the insurance carrier thinks feels is reasonable. And then phase three is project management, which is overseeing the project and overseeing, we call it contractor management more than project management because the contractor manages the project, but we manage the contractor. So each of those, each of you on the phone or whoever's uh, participating has to determine what you want to be. If you want to be a turnkey program that says, I'm going to do the assessment um, and then I'm going to work with the GC to get the pricing, and then I'm going to assist with managing the job. That's one. That's like all, all. I'm all in. We're doing the whole thing. We're all in. Or you can be just an accessibility specialist who goes out, does an assessment, turns it over to the insurance company or whoever, and then it's up to them to go get the assessment, to go get the estimate, or to get bids or whatever else. You really have to weigh out the risk reward risk reward for yourself and how big or how far you want to expand your business. And and I can't I mean I we can talk about that during the course or we can, you know, you can email me or whatever and I can give you some information. But in my world, um that's we became the full service and that became the expectations um of of us. I'll tell you the biggest challenge and the biggest risk is, is not in the assessment and it's not in the price, but it's in managing the jobs because that's where if something goes wrong, that's where the biggest liability is. Um, we have a program internally that we're beginning to work with accessibility specialists who say, we just want to do the assessment, but we want to offer the full package and we're going to outsource the project management back to the David Corey company. So you can go out to somebody and say, we'll, we'll do the full service, but just know that our strategic partner is the David Corey company who's going to help manage that process on our behalf. And then we can explain more what that means to you. But if you want to do it completely in-house, um, we can help you figure that out as well. So from a revenue perspective, if you're only doing an assessment, um, it, it, it really depends on your comfort level on what you want to charge hourly for that assessment. Uh, most carriers expect time and expense um, for your professional job. Um, we took initially when we started, uh, I thought oh, I want to be reasonable. So don't price yourself out of the market. But reasonable to me was what is a health insurance company or Medicare or someone paying for a skilled um, functional assessment? You know, what's the hourly rate that they're actually paying? Not what the therapist is making, but what are they paying the rehab company for that hour to two hour assessment? And that dollar amount is what we determine initially what we would charge. As our services have improved and as we have seen more 
um, I guess uh, as, as our um, as our product has improved and as as our as we've had to delineate ourselves a little bit, um, I would tell you that the hourly rate that I see most often ranges between a um, hundred an hour time and expense to I've seen 175 an hour time and expense. And so what that means is in the, in the industry is that it's not just time on site. So if you're living in, um, let's say Dallas, Texas, and you've got to drive into the outside of Fort Worth and you've got an hour and a half drive, your clock starts from the time you leave the house to the time you get back to the house and the rate stays the same. You don't do any travel from on-site time. It's your professional time. Um, if you think of yourself, you, you, I, I believe that you bill someone like an, an attorney with or anyone else. If your hands are on it, yeah, if, you've, if you're on a phone call, if you're, if you're uh, creating a report, if you're on site, if you're traveling, all of that is billable time. And I think that's respected. But what I would highly recommend is that the dollar amount you choose to charge for your services, it needs to be aligned in your level of expertise in that field at this time. So what I wouldn't do is go out and charge $200 an hour and you're just getting your feet wet and comp and the product doesn't match the investment by the carrier. So just be aware of that. Um, there are no, in workers comp via through the healthcare system, there are um, uh, ceilings or caps on like OT treatments, PT treatments, those things. But you do you as an accessibility specialist, there is no code, there is no regulation, there is no, you know, it's, it's the strangest thing. One of the reasons I'm not a clinical OT anymore is because I got sick and tired of all the layers of bureaucracy and charting and always auditing and something going on, and I got it just driving me nuts. And what we have right now in our industry is freedom to to ap apply all those things you love is an OT without having all the big brother standing over your shoulder, forcing you to add more units or encouraging you to do things that you know that are unethical. So you have to, I'm a believer that you find out what is reasonable in your area and that's what you charge and you stick with it and don't be apologetic for it. Um, but just know that and I will tell you this, there are companies out there who will, charge $500 for an assessment. And, but what the, the product that they're delivering is not the same product that a company like ours delivers. So um, there's companies rehab without walls is one of them. There's other national rehab companies that do home health that will say they do a home assessment, but the product they get back is, is, is it is what it is. You just, you get what you pay for. Um, and we'll talk more about that in class and we can, show you what um what a more skilled assessment might look like in our in our industry um so that there's another a little bit of that yes that was good thank you there's another question will we get a template for reports and is there a software with one what would you recommend with that no yeah yes and no so we'll give you our template we use it we use what we call the attack method and it's just an acronym that stands for something when we go through each room um, I can give you templates that we use that you can just kind of use to, to work off of. There is no software that I'm aware of that's a standard in our industry. There may be some, there's a few others that are out there, but there's really not. Um, and there's various reasons why, but, but certainly we'll, we'll give you our templates when you come to the class and you can work off those anytime you want. Actually, I built kind of a template around the um, magic plan that allows me to yep. make comments around each room. Um, yep. We have, that's helpful with that. Um, there was one other question that we didn't answer. So how many CHAMP specialists are there and what is the oh, opportunity for us to then work with you? I mean, I know you said we could look at working with you to have you do the full service piece if we just wanted to do the um, right. consultation right. piece. Right, right. So here, so good question. So number of people in the industry 
that are champ certified. Our contractors around 300 nationally. Um, the, from an OT perspective, man, how many were in your class? So was there what about four? four? Yeah, and that's about five. what is on average in the class, and I'm before or five. So I would say there's probably, oh man, last like maybe 20, 25. Um, we started including accessibility specialists, um, and a couple of years ago, and so it's it, it, it's 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 much more contractor heavy. But I will tell you this, um, you know, it's one of those things that. There, just because you know, there's that saying: um, uh, "Give a man a fish, feed him for a day; teach a man to fish, to feed him for a lifetime." I, I think that's cool, and I think, but I think you can't just because you teach a man to fish doesn't mean they're going to fish. The majority of the people who come to class um, are given really cool opportunities and information to go back and apply. But I will tell you, 90% probably maybe less than that 80 percent don't ever apply so what they want is to come to class and then to leave and then just be given claims you know that they're just going to magically appear and that's not the way it happens right so we can teach and we can encourage but until the app until the person who's put the energy resources time in it actually goes out and begins to apply it nothing really happens so um, I would tell you that my objective was never to build this national brand with hundreds and hundreds of graduates and all of that. My, my hope was to find a few really good people who are not only enthusiastic, but have the ability and then to build a program that are, that are very dependable educated, um, consistent, uh, uh, to, to build a program around that kind of populace. Right. Um, but I'll tell you again, the, of those that come, there's few that will actually go back and, and try to apply it. There are those. And I would tell you that over the years, um, there's been a handful, there's been a couple, maybe three, right now that I, well, maybe more, maybe four or five that I have personally mentored. And I thought, man, this person is going to knock it out of the park. And two of them I hired actually inside our company they actually were full time with us. And one of them absolutely crashed and burned. And I don't, I don't know what happened. And the other one went to work for one of my competitors. So um, there are there are there is opportunity and i just my brother always says don't mistake enthusiasm for ability and there's very few therapists that i've ever met and we spent 20 minutes one-on-one -on -one talking about business that didn't go okay that's what i want to do and then nothing ever really happened so i would encourage you to think about it um uh, helping you be successful would be a wonderful i think this network that you guys are have right now that you're that you guys have developed is a great way to um, kind of mentor each other and create some ideas on how to build the business together. That's, that's huge. And if I can help you in territories, I can certainly, as, as I look at the vision of what happens next year in 21 and 22 and 23 and beyond to be able to create a program where I have individuals like yourselves, in, in specific areas that we can assist and, you know, that as our business grows, we can continue to incorporate you guys as independent contractors and, you know, whatever we can do. I mean, that's, that's kind of part of the process as well. So, but yeah. Okay. Does Anything anybody else? else have any other questions? Has this been helpful? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think Corey, you may be hearing from a few of us. Yeah, happy happy to hear from you. Um, and uh, as and I'll get off right after I say this and let you guys finish your call. But um, I think again, you guys, there is 
I, I told my stepfather, who was my mentor, that um, the day that I retire, finish whatever I want to do, if I can look back and have the same influence on our industry as he had on his industry, I will have felt that I did a good job. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about um, uh, anything notoriety or anything like that. It was all about taking an industry that desperately needs change uh, and then help facilitate that by doing things differently to get a better result. And that's really what I've been about. And our industry is, um, has a history of good old boy network. Uh, it, there's the majority of business is done by giant network companies that put in ridiculous markups and it's hidden and it's secret and there's all this stuff going on. And I just don't play that game anymore. So ever, I've never played that game and I don't want to participate in it. So I've kind of gone the narrow road and I, I would love to have people like yourselves um, begin to work within our company, not our company, but our industry that recognizes the opportunity for, to, to make some really good impact and, and to do it in a way that gives better outcomes, that's transparent, that's reasonable, that's cooperative. Um, and, and so if, if you're interested, stay in touch. Um, and if I can help you, I, I'm happy to do that. But you guys, uh, you're doing a great work and the things that you're doing already and the fact that you're involved in this um, is, 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 is a positive sign. So good good luck with all of you. And uh, I'm, I'll get off now. And if there's anything else I can do, just let me know, Casey. Okay, I just want to give you a couple of the comments that I know you can't see sure. them. Um, yes, this was helpful. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. This was uh, very interesting and helpful, very informative. Thank you. Thanks so much for everything. It's been informative. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. That's great to hear. Happy to hear it. Happy to help. You guys have Thanks. a wonderful evening, okay? Thank you, you so too. much, because I know it's mm -hmm. almost 10 o'clock at night over there. So Yeah, it's okay. Take care now. All right, thank you for joining us. Bye -bye. All right, everybody. So that was good, right? When he finally come on, better than me representing it. You did good, sir. <laughs> you did very good, very good. Yeah. <laughs> I am so glad that I had pulled my book out the other day because <laughs> I had needed to do something with it. Um, but yes, so exciting. I... Um, I did get a lot from the program. Um, again, I took mine right as COVID hit. Literally, I came back and got pneumonia um, and was out. So, um, you know, that was some of the, the thing with getting back, but I'm getting back now working with the workers' comp attorneys and starting to look with workers' comp and working with Corey. So there's definitely some markets out there. Volume, again, is gonna depend on where you are and how well you can connect with those case managers that manage the workers' comp as well, because they tend to be the people that are recommending the services and that are going to do that. So, any other questions? All right, everybody, have a good evening. I think we are back Wednesday night, is it, for another training for those in the Home Mods program. I know that uh, those in the home months program, there's also the um, Medicare billing starting um, tomorrow if you're going to be in that. Um, so everyone have a good night and uh, stay safe. Thanks for everything, Sue. You're Thank welcome. You. Good luck with the rest of your recovery cast. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, thanks. Good night.